Good morning. Oh, it's good to see so many people here this morning. This is the fifth Sunday in the season of Easter. We're getting very close to Pentecost. This morning, let's do something different. I want you to turn around and wave at some of the folks that you may not have seen this morning. Let's take a second and wave at your neighbors. That's our version of passing the peace without touch. <laughs> we greet each other in the name of Christ, and we wish each other peace in his name. Uh, if you are watching virtually, I invite you to fill out the contact card so that we know you were in worship with us this morning. We want to make sure that we know who was here. And if you have any prayer requests, also you can write those uh, in on your contact card. Uh, our announcements for the week. Our prayer group is going to meet here at the church in person in the fellowship hall. So uh, this is the first time that we'll be back in a long time, and I'm happy to gather together. Um, then at, at about 1.45, the group who is studying uh, the Good Morning book, the grief study, is going to carpool over to Faye Marlowe's home. And we're going to be sitting outside. I think the forecast looks like it's pretty good for for tomorrow, maybe I think there's a small chance of rain, but we hope it happens before or after. <laughs> so please wear a mask and we'll sit outside where we can be socially distanced. Um, today, after worship, we have a congregational meeting and I hope that you'll all stay for this important meeting. Let's begin our worship. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please rise for the call to worship. Those who seek God shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before God. Dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Posterity will serve God. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn. <laughs> seated. We enter our time of prayer now when we go to God with our concerns and we share those with each other so that we can pray with each other and for each other. Do you have prayer concerns that you'd like to offer this morning? Yes, Janie. Tell me his first name again. Mel, okay. We lift up Mel at the passing of his wife. God, in your mercy. This morning, I, uh, I pray for openness and honesty and respectful discussion and action toward racial and economic justice in our homes, in our city, and in our nation. God, in your mercy. And today, I pray for each one of you. 
I pray for all of the things that you are going through on a personal level. I also pray for your life together as a church. God, in your mercy, will you bow with me? Oh God, who holds us all in love, you have given us Christ, your true vine. And in Christ, we draw our life and our strength. As we gather to praise your name, open our hearts to receive your life-giving spirit. Show us ways to be more fruitful branches and to bear the fruit of love and care that we experience in you and in your son. Hear the prayers of our lips and of our hearts. Show us how to truly love as you have commanded through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning, we are going to be steeped in the Word. I've actually got two of the lectionary scriptures that we'll be hearing today. Uh, first is 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. And then the gospel reading is from the gospel according to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that he bears, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. 
just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide by me, in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. These are the words of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. In this congregation, when someone gives a contribution that's in memory of someone, a memorial, it's placed in a special fund. It's called Abiding Memorials. Instead of being deposited into the general fund, these memorials are set aside, they're saved and protected. They're left untouched until the group, the fund's caretakers, determine a, a purpose for them. These are truly abiding memorials, continuing for a long time, enduring, as we define the word. Abiding, enduring, remaining for a long time. That's what Jesus had on his mind as he gathered in that upper room with his disciples. He was going to say farewell. He had some very important messages to convey, and he did not have a lot of time to do it. I am the good shepherd. We heard about that last week. I am the good shepherd, he told them. Listen for my voice. Follow me. I won't lead you astray. And I am the vine. Today we heard that scripture. Abide in me as I abide in you. Stay true. Stay near. Bear fruit. Bear my fruit. With beautiful analogies, these word pictures, Jesus is not saying goodbye forever. He's saying farewell until we meet again. Abide in me as I abide in you. This week I heard of the death of Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins. Collins is probably the least well-known of the three who made that mission. And in part, it's because he never set foot on the moon. The only one of the three. Michael Collins instead was piloting the command module 60 miles above the surface of the moon. The hearing of Colin's death, I was reminded of the story of what one of those three men, Buzz Aldrin, did on the surface of the moon that, during that mission. Buzz Aldrin read this scripture. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me will bring forth much fruit. And then Aldrin set the Lord's table on the moon alone. And he wrote this description for Guidepost magazine in 1970. I ate the tiny host and swallowed the wine. I gave thanks for the intelligence and spirit that had brought two young pilots to the Sea of Tranquility. It was interesting for me to think the very first liquid ever poured on the moon and the very first food eaten there were the communion elements. And so, just before I partook of the elements, I read the words which I had chosen to indicate our trust that as man probes into space, we are in fact acting in Christ. Collins was strengthened and encouraged by Christ living in him so that he was able to take the next step, acting in Christ, Abide with me, even as I abide in you, even on the moon, Emmanuel, God with us everywhere. Abiding in Christ can give us a wonderful feeling of peace and calm, but Jesus was clear. We have to do something with our, what we were given in our time on the vine, and that something, Jesus says, is love. We are to love. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We abide in Christ, in Jesus, and Jesus abides in us when we keep God's commandments. And then the next verse spells out what we must do. It says, this is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. Moving on to our second scripture from 1 John, the writer of this letter builds on the words of Jesus. He acknowledges the boldness that we can receive from abiding in Christ, but he reminds us that we have work to do. We have fruit to bear. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So what's that, God? That loving is so hard if we do it right. When we love in Christ as God wants us to love, we have to give up a lot of things. We have to give up anger and grudges that we're holding against people. We have to give up disdain and fear of people who are not like us. We have to give up the attitude of me first instead of we first. And we have to give up feeling superior to others around us because we know that our way is always the best way. Any of those ring true? So many things that we have to give up in order to love in the way of Jesus. And giving up these negative barriers to love is often harder than giving up chocolate for Lent. But if we are in Christ, if we abide in Jesus, and Jesus abides in us, love is the only possible fruit that we can bear. As the saying goes, if we get the tree right, then the fruit will be right. If we get the tree right, then the fruit will be right. If we abide in Jesus, we are abiding in love, and the fruit of that tree is love, nothing else. But there's one more thing that Jesus teaches us about life in the vine. Jesus says that as branches who are striving to thrive, striving to abide in love, we can still expect to pick up a little bit of dead wood along the way. And what happens is that we need to be pruned back just a little bit. A couple of months ago, I began kitchen gardening. My first crop was basil. I planted the seeds in miracle Grow soil and watered it and kept it under the special light. And the plant looked really fantastic. It looked great until I harvested the first bunch. We were having pizza and we needed a half cup. That's an awful lot of basil. Well, according to the wizards on the internet, to pick basil without harming it, you snip off the bouquets in a specific way. If you make your cut just above a node, a little knot in the branch, then two branches will form from that node. For several days, I saw nothing. Nothing but the few leaves that remained and a bunch of sticks. A bunch of green sticks. Nothing sprouting. It really seemed unlikely that anything was going to happen. And I wondered even if I had killed the plant. But then it happened. Almost microscopically at first, two shoots, just as promised, two shoots emerged from nearly every stem that had been pruned in that harvest. And because of the pruning, my basil plant is going to be fuller with even more leaves than before. The same thing happened this year with a Chinese almond bush that was in our backyard. We had another bush that was encroaching on it and was leaning over it. It was taking the sun from it and crowding everything out. And so Chris pruned both of them back, both of them. And now we have two healthy plants. Proper pruning improves plants. And proper pruning by God can improve us as well. 
we may be enjoying life in the vine just a little bit too much, and we become complacent. Our work as Christians can slow down a little bit when we're too happy. <laughs> or we may have decided that there are some people who don't deserve to be in the vine with us, and we forget the greatest commandment. And then God, as the one who tends the vineyard, may step in to make things right again. And what is left in us is better and stronger and healthier, and the fruit that we bear is more like the love that we receive from the vine. There's one verse in that scripture from John that I always struggle with. It's part of this farewell discourse. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This verse and others like it in the Bible have been misused by those who claim that if you are a Christian and if you are doing it correctly, then everything that you ask for will come from God. Health, wealth, all the trappings, prosperity without end. Now, deep down, I know that even though we would like for this to be true, we know that it's not. Our experience tells us that it's not. God is not an ATM machine. God is not a genie who rubs a lamp for us. So the key to this verse is realizing what happens to us when we abide in the vine, when we live in the vine. When we abide in Jesus, and Jesus abides in us. We are changed. Over time, because we're transformed by Christ, life lived truly in the vine, it changes everything. Our perspective shifts a little bit as we're exposed to the love of Christ. The things that we wanted before, that we thought we really needed, really had to have, as we learn to abide in Christ, some of those things seem trivial. Some of them seem selfish or maybe even wrong. In Christ, we grow to want better things. We grow to want the things that Christ wants, the things that please God. And suddenly, what God loves, loving our neighbors more fully and completely, doesn't seem so difficult after all. Over and over this past year, the words of a medieval mystic have come to mind. Her name is Julian of Norwich, and she reported hearing Jesus say these words in a vision. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. All shall be well when we abide in the love of Christ, and all shall be well in our world when the fruit that we produce is of God's love. Amen. Now, I want you to remember that melody because I'm going to talk about it when we go to the communion meditation. As we abide in Christ, and as Christ abides in us, we cannot help but be changed by that love. Each week, we share this love with our neighbors. We share out of our abundance our time, our talents, and our offerings. We help to heal the people in Bartlesville and beyond. Please rise in body or in spirit as we dedicate our offerings for this morning.
communion should be a time of celebration. One of my favorite communion hymns is Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ Us, right here in our chalice hymnal. And that's the melody of it that, that uh, Lisa just played for us. It has, it's a joyous Jamaican tune, and the lyrics are also wonderful. We sang this hymn during communion more than a decade ago at my ordination because it is a celebration. The words of the third verse speak to me today. Jesus calls us in, send us, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt, gives us love to tell, bread to share. God, Emmanuel, everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. God's love is found here, even in a small, tiny piece of bread and a little thimble full of juice. It is abundant. It reminds us of the vine that nourishes us, that sends us out to share, bearing fruit in a world of doubt. Let's pray. Ever-present creator God, we gather in this holy place to celebrate the gift of life, eternal life, offered freely to all who choose to accept it. As we participate in this holy act of sharing a loaf and cup, confessing our sins of humanness, renewing our determination to demonstrate God's love by expression and deed, Live our lives in the light of God's grace and the teaching of his Son, the risen Christ. This day and the day coming, we strive to honor God, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit that dwells in each of us. Let us open our hearts and minds and receive the wisdom to understand God's response. Amen. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread and giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it and he shared it with his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, in like manner, Jesus took a cup and he poured it giving thanks to God. This cup is a covenant renewed in my blood. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me until I come again. All are invited to this table. We're set by Christ. We take our places thankfully and joyfully.
Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. It's so good to abide in the vine. So good to be a part of, of something that nourishes us and keeps us fed and strong and going. And it feeds us the best fruit of all. And that fruit is love. It's the pure, unadulterated, non-judgmental love that, that we get from only from God. Sometimes we get glimpses of it here on earth, and hopefully we are able to take some of that love that we've seen from God and share it. I hope that you'll make that your charge for this week. Please remember to stay for our congregational meeting immediately after the service. And now may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious, gracious, upon, gracious unto you, and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.